Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, the premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 176 of our Pharmacotherapy MCQ series which majors in infectious diseases. And the first question reads, SBB a 65-year-old male patient is admitted to the general medical ward of the hospital for acute coronary syndrome. She has a past medical history significant for hypertension and dyslipidemia. On hospital day 4, he develops signs and symptoms consistent with pneumonia but remains hemodynamically stable and does not require ventilator support. SBB hasn't been hospitalized recently neither has he had any antibiotic exposure. Your hospital antibiogram with the percentage of isolates susceptible to relevant pathogens is shown in the next slide. So my question to you is, which of the following would be the most appropriate empiric antibiotic therapy for SBB? Would it be a. vancomycin plus cefepime, or b. linozolid plus papericillin, tazobactam, or c. ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, or would it be d. cefepime? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, D, cefepime. SBB's pneumonia is hospital acquired because it developed more than 48 hours after admission. Ceftriaxone plus azithromycin is not appropriate for SBB because it lacks coverage for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a common cause of hospital acquired pneumonia. Cefepime provides coverage for methicillin-susceptible Staphylococcus aureus, MSSA, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and other gram-negative bacilli that commonly cause hospital-acquired pneumonia. She has no indications for either methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA coverage or double Pseudomonas aeruginosa coverage. She is not considered high mortality risk that is she is not in septic shock and was not mechanically ventilated as a result of this hospital acquired pneumonia, which is an indication for both MRSA and double P. aeruginosa coverage. She has not received IV antibiotics in the past 90 days, which would be a risk factor for MRSA and multidrug resistant MDR pseudomonas aeruginosa. She does not have structural lung disease, which is a risk factor for MDR pseudomonas aeruginosa. The hospital antibiogram indicates the local MRSA prevalence is less than 20%, which is an indication for MRSA coverage. The hospital antibiogram demonstrates that greater than 86% of the tested Pseudomonas aeruginosa isolates are susceptible to cefepime, which is greater than the other anti-pseudomonal drugs for which antibiogram data are available for. Therefore, cefepime is the best choice for SBB. 
Linozolid plus papericillin tazobactam is not appropriate for SBB because coverage for MRSA is not indicated since he has not received IV antibiotics within the past 90 days. He contracted the infection in a hospital with a MRSA prevalence less than 20%, and he does not appear to be at high risk of death. Ventilator support is not required, and he does not have septic shock. Vancomycin plus cefepime is not appropriate for SBB because coverage for MRSA is not indicated since he has not received IV antibiotics within the past 90 days. He contracted the infection in a hospital with a MRSA prevalence less than 20%, and he does not appear to be at high risk of death. Ventilator support is not required, and he does not have septic shock. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, which of the following would you consider as an appropriate evidence-based clinical application i.e., use of procalcitonin serum concentrations as an adjunct to clinical judgment to guide antibiotic therapy for lower respiratory tract infections? Would it be a. Ruling out the need for antibiotic therapy in patients with suspected influenza, or b. Discontinuing antibiotic therapy in patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, or, C. Initiating antibiotic therapy in patients with suspected community-acquired pneumonia, CAP, or would it be, D. Escalating antibiotic therapy in patients with hospital-associated pneumonia, HAP. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is, B. Discontinuing antibiotic therapy in patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP. Available data demonstrating the accuracy of procalcitonin serum concentrations for identifying patients with inadequately treated HAP currently are lacking. Available data indicate only modest accuracy of procalcitonin serum concentrations for identifying community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, and clinical data supporting the use of procalcitonin serum concentrations for determining whether to initiate antibiotic therapy in patients with suspected CAP are lacking. Multiple randomized controlled trials demonstrate that the use of procalcitonin serum concentrations along with clinical criteria for decision-making about when to discontinue antibiotic therapy in patients with VAP can reduce the duration of antibiotic exposure without a negative impact on clinical outcomes. Available data indicate only modest accuracy of procalcitonin serum concentrations for identifying community-acquired bacterial pneumonia, and clinical data supporting the use of procalcitonin serum concentrations to differentiate community-acquired bacterial pneumonia from influenza are lacking. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, TZZ, a 47-year-old male patient was admitted to your general medical ward with influenza. He has a past medical history significant for hypertension and COPD. He subsequently developed pneumonia caused by methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. His current treatment comprises of IV vancomycin 1000 mg twice daily and seems to be improving clinically. His weight is 75 kg, while his height is 70 inches. His pertinent labs include a serum creatinine that is stable at 1.1 mg per deciliter, a BUN that is stable at 17 mg per deciliter, and his urine output has not changed since beginning vancomycin. A vancomycin trough serum concentration measured immediately before the fourth vancomycin dose, 36 hours after the first vancomycin dose, is 22.2 mg per liter. 
So my question to you is, which of the following would be the most appropriate course of action for TZZ's IV vancomycin therapy? Would it be a change 1000 mg twice daily to 750 mg twice daily, or b change 1000 mg twice daily to 750 mg thrice daily, or c change 1000 mg twice daily to 1250 mg once daily, or would it be d continue 1000 mg twice daily? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is A. Change 1000 mg twice daily to 750 mg twice daily. The measured steady state, which is approximately four half lives following the first dose, vancomycin trough concentration of 22.2 mg per litre, is above the currently recommended target range of 15 to 20 mg per litre, to achieve trough concentration between 15 and 20 mg per litre, a dose reduction and or extension of the dosing interval is necessary. Assuming the patient's renal function remains stable, vancomycin 1000 mg every 12 hour will continue to result in steady state trough concentrations greater than 20 mg per deciliter. Because vancomycin follows first order linear pharmacokinetics, a new dose or estimated steady state trough concentration for a given new dose can be derived through proportions C steady state new divided by 24 hours dose new is equal to C steady state old divided by 24 hours dose old. Based on this principle of first-order pharmacokinetics, vancomycin 1250 mg every 24 hour is estimated to result in a steady state trough concentration of less than 13.9 mg per deciliter x divided by 1250 mg is equal to 22.2 mg per liter divided by 2000 x is equal to 13.9 mg per Per liter, which is below the target range of 15 to 20 mg per deciliter. Because the dosing interval was extended from 12 hours to 24 hours, the estimated trough concentration will actually be less than the estimated 13.9 mg per liter derived from the proportion. This is because the proportion method assumes the old and new dosing regimen have the same dosing interval, and the inverse relationship between trough concentrations and dosing interval is not perfectly proportional. The equations and variables used a Cockcroft Galt estimate of creatinine clearance, CRCL using male sex, age, actual body weight, and serum creatinine, elimination constant, K, E, is equal to 0.000. 083 multiplied by creatinine clearance, plus 0.0044, and half-life, T1 half is equal to 0.693 divided by elimination constant, K, E. And the next question reads, which of the following is the highest level of currently available evidence to support the use of ceftazidime, avobactam for the treatment of patients with ventilator-associated pneumonia VAP caused by carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriaceae, abbreviated as CRE, is it a randomized controlled trial data from patients with nosocomial pneumonia, including VAP, or b non-comparative observational data from patients with VAP caused by CRE, or, C, comparative observational data from patients with bloodstream infections caused by CRE, or is it, D, data from in vivo animal models of pneumonia caused by CRE? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options.
and the correct answer is b non-comparative observational data from patients with VAP caused by CIE. Numerous reports of humans receiving ceftazidime avobactam for the treatment of VAP caused by CIE have been published, providing a higher level of evidence than data from in vivo animal models. Although the results from two observational comparative studies suggest that ceftazidime, avobactam may be superior to alternative therapies for infections caused by CIE, only a small portion of these patients had pneumonia and no comparison of outcomes in a pneumonia subgroup was presented. This limits the external generalizability of these data for patients with VAP caused by CIE. Subgroups of case series, an observational comparative study, and randomized controlled trials provide observational, non-comparative data that estimate the efficacy of ceftazidime avobactam for treating VAP caused by CRE. Although results of a randomized controlled trial by Torres and colleagues suggest that ceftazidime, avobactam may be non-inferior to meropenem for the treatment of nosocomial pneumonia, only one-third of participants had VAP, approximately 5% were infected with a carbapenem-resistant organism, and less than 1% were infected with CRE, limiting the external generalizability of these data for the treatment of patients with VAP caused by CRE. Please advance to the next question. And the next question reads, which of the oral levofloxacin regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for use as outpatient therapy for adult patients with suspected community-acquired bacterial pneumonia and normal renal function, would it be a 750 mg once daily for 5 days, or b 750 mg once daily for 3 days, or, c, 500 mg once daily for 5 days, or would it be, d, 500 mg once daily for 3 days? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options. And the correct answer is A. 750 mg once daily for 5 days. Data from the use of oral levofloxacin 750 mg daily suggest that the minimum required duration of treatment for community-acquired pneumonia is 5 days 3 days of therapy, is inadequate, regardless of dose. Data from the use of oral levofloxacin 500 mg daily suggest that treatment for 7 to 10 days is required for community-acquired pneumonia. 5 days of therapy with levofloxacin 500 mg is inadequate in a patient with normal renal function. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, SWW, a 69-year-old female patient presents to your accident and emergency department with a chief complaint of malaise, body aches, subjective fever, and a new onset shortness of breath with increased home oxygen requirements. SWW's symptoms began 72 hours ago. She has a past medical history significant for type 2 diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease stage 3, and COPD. SWW is admitted to the general medical ward of the hospital and diagnosed with influenza confirmed by reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction testing. So my question to you is which of the regimens listed below would be the most appropriate for SWW now? Would it be a. Do not initiate any antiviral medication, or b. Initiate oral oseltamivir, or c. Initiate IV paramivir, or would it be d. Initiate inhaled zanamivir? I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options.
and the correct answer is b initiate oral oseltamivir. Inhaled zanamivir is not recommended for hospitalized patients with influenza due to a lack of clinical data in this patient population. Inhaled zanamivir also is not recommended in patients with underlying respiratory disease, such as COPD. In hospitalized patients, intravenous paramivir is reserved for patients who cannot absorb oral oseltamivir e.g., because of gastric stasis, gastrointestinal bleeding, or malabsorption, because data supporting the use of paramivir for severe influenza in hospitalized adults are lacking. Although this patient presented for treatment more than 48 hours after symptom onset, the greatest benefit from antiviral drug therapy is seen in patients presenting within 48 hours. Some data suggest a benefit in hospitalized patients even when antiviral treatment is started after more than 48 hours have elapsed since symptom onset. The Infectious Diseases Society of America and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC recommend treatment with antiviral agents for patients hospitalized due to influenza, even when it is initiated more than 48 hours after symptom onset. The CDC also recommends treatment of patients at high risk of complications, including patients with diabetes and COPD, to prevent further complications. Oral oseltamivir is the best choice for this patient. Please progress to the next question. And the next question reads, TGG, a 45-year-old female patient was admitted to the neurologic ICU following a stroke. She requires mechanical ventilation. She has a past medical history significant for type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension and dyslipidemia. On hospital day 5, she developed ventilator-associated pneumonia VAP. A tracheal aspirate was sent for culture, and she was initiated on vancomycin, cefepime, and ciprofloxacin. She has now been in hospital for a week. Her pertinent vitals, current medications, laboratory test results, and the neurologic ICU antibiogram data are shown below. Norepinephrine was initiated this morning due to hypotension that was refractory to fluid resuscitation. Her pertinent vitals include a body temperature of 39 degrees Celsius, a mean arterial pressure of 63 millimeters of mercury, a heart rate of 87 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of 24 breaths per minute. Her pertinent labs include a serum creatinine of 1 mg per deciliter, a BUN of 15 mg per deciliter, lactate of 3.4 mmol per liter, a WBC 13 times 10 power 9 cells per liter. Her culture results from the tracheal aspirate grow pseudominus aeruginosa. Pause the video and scrutinize the table before proceeding to the next slide. Her current medications include cefepime 2 grams infused IV over 3 hours thrice daily, vancomycin 1,500 mg infused IV over 2 hours twice daily, ciprofloxacin 400 mg infused IV over 60 minutes thrice daily, norepinephrine 0.2 micrograms per kilogram per minute IV, propofol 0.6 mg per kilogram per hour IV, dex Metatomidine 0.6 micrograms per kilogram per hour IV. Apart from discontinuing vancomycin, which of the following modifications to TGG's antibiotic therapy is most appropriate at this time? Is it a. Continue cefepime, discontinue ciprofloxacin, and add tobramycin, or b. Discontinue cefepime and ciprofloxacin and add ceftolazane, tazobactam, or C. Discontinue cefepime and ciprofloxacin and add meropenem, or is it D. Discontinue ciprofloxacin and continue cefepime. I will give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer to this question from the listed options.
and the correct answer is a. Continue cefepime, discontinue ciprofloxacin, and add tobramycin. Although the pathogen is susceptible to cefepime, its use as monotherapy is not appropriate in this patient who is in septic shock using both the old definition of septic shock, based on two of four criteria for systemic inflammatory response syndrome and requirement for vasopressor therapy, and the newer definition, that is, serum lactate greater than 2 millimoles per liter and requirement for vasopressor therapy. Current recommendations from the Infectious Diseases Society of America and American Thoracic Society call for combination therapy in patients with VAP who remain in septic shock, even after antimicrobial susceptibilities are known because of a potential mortality benefit. Although the pathogen is susceptible to meropenem, discontinuing cefepime and ciprofloxacin and adding meropenem is not the best choice for this patient because the use of monotherapy is not appropriate, and there are no data to suggest that meropenem will be more efficacious than cefepime for treating VAP. Although the pathogen is susceptible to ceftolazane tazobactam, discontinuing cefepime and ciprofloxacin and adding ceftolazane tazobactam is not the best choice for this patient because the use of monotherapy is not appropriate, and there are few data to support the use of ceftolazane tazobactam to treat VAP or suggest that it will be more efficacious than cefepime for treating VAP. Continuing cefepime and adding tobramycin is the only choice that employs combination therapy with two active antibiotics, so it is the best choice for this patient. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 177.